Praise the Lord. I'm Pastor Stephen Shelley, and you're watching The Eagle's Cry. I want to welcome you to the broadcast today, and I want to say that God is doing extraordinary, marvelous, wonderful, supernatural things in the earth. And if you're not a part of the move of God, it's time for you to connect in. It's time for you to call on the name of the Lord, receive salvation, let Him cover your sins, wash you with His blood, and fill you with His Spirit. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer, but you're not really born again, you're a part of a church, but you've never experienced God. You mean to tell me, preacher, I can experience God for myself? Not only can you, friend, you must. You must have an encounter with God and be changed as an individual. How do I do that? By searching the scripture, by finding out what God's word has to say about a place of intimacy and relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I tell you, I thank God for the church. It is a living, moving, breathing organism. But I'm more interested in relationship than I am the church. So it's very possible for you to be a part of a church and not know God. You may know programs, you may know liturgy, but you may have never had an encounter with God for yourself. It's time, and I invite you to do that. Please contact our ministry if we can be of any service to you, if we can encourage you, give you teaching instruction, anything that we can do to help you, that's what we want to do. And so we just release a blessing over you right now as you spend the next few minutes with us uh, searching the scripture, looking at what God's word has to say about our lives and what's available to us as believers in this hour. I just pray that you'll be extremely blessed today and I invite you once again to contact our ministry, New Hope Revival Ministries. All the information is shown to you right there on the screen. Take it down, write it down and contact us this week. I, I know that you'll be blessed and I know we'll be blessed. We are certainly interested in hearing from you and where you watch this program. Let's look right to the Word of God today, shall we? Last week we started a teaching on how we exercise our spiritual senses. Now, uh, what, what do we mean by that? What do we mean by that? Well, what does exercise mean? To use. You know, it, uh, I, I found out, oh, I don't know, a year and a half ago or something like that, I started trying to, to do some serious exercise. I've got a long way to go to be physically fit, but I'm working on it. I started doing some exercises, and the first thing I found out was I had muscles in places that I didn't know I had any muscle. Well, how did you find out? Well, I started using them. And when I did, they showed up with a lot of pain. These muscles responded and they let me know, I'm here, I'm underworked, I'm underused, but I have been here all along. And uh, I mean, for days, I would be sore. And even now, if we concentrate on a certain uh, area of muscles in a workout, then the next day, that soreness moves in. But it's good. It's really a good thing. And this is going to sound very strange, but I like it. I have actually enjoyed the soreness. Somebody said, well, you must really be wacky. Well, the reason why is because it tells me that I'm making progress. It tells me that I am using my muscles and what I'm actually doing sounds pretty terrible, doesn't it? But I'm actually making tiny tears in those muscles and then my body, so intricately designed by God, rushes in to heal those stretches, those tiny tears where the muscle has been stretched beyond its normal uh, range of motion. And in healing, it strengthens the muscle. It builds up and increases the, the uh, ability of that muscle to, to help sustain my body and, and strength. And I noticed it, the first time I noticed that I had a little more strength was when I had to pick up a heavy suitcase or a heavy bag of trash and I just tossed it up into, hey, that felt good. And so exercising, the Bible talks about faith 
We're kind of like a muscle. Every man's given a measure of faith. But the more we use faith, the more we exercise faith, the stronger our faith becomes. And so uh, as we learn to exercise the senses of our spirit man, we will find out that we're developing something. We're developing a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and we're developing uh, the ability to live a supernatural life. And so in the natural, we are given five senses that our body uses, or actually more, but five that we, we learned in school, five senses to contact or to have communication with our earthly environment. What we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, and what we are able to physically feel. And that information that we gather, it goes into our uh, brain and spiritually, though, we receive a lot of that information into our soul. Somebody said, well, what in the world do you mean by that? Well, you can go to the doctor and you can try to believe God for your healing, but you go to the doctor and he gives you a bad report. You hear that bad report. It could be cancer. It could be heart disease. It could be this. It could be that. And that information goes into your brain and uh, it filters into your soul. And if you're not careful, you'll just give up and die. Really, you'll just give up and die. Well, that's what the doctor said. Your soul will be cast down. The Bible talks about the casting down of the soul. You're, you're, you'll be pulled down and that will be like a wet blanket on the fiery faith that you once had. And so it affects you. It affects you. What you hear affects you. What you see, your eye gate, what comes in affects you and uh, uh, so forth and etc. These, uh, these five senses affect us in our soulish realm. Now we talked about the fact that we're triune beings, body, soul, and spirit because we're made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 27 said, so God created man in his own image. Now we started the program last time with John chapter 3 with a scripture that says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So you have a fleshly man and you have a spiritual man. The spiritual man is made up of both soul and spirit. Spirit is the inside of the inside. We said that we are sort of made like a three-story house. We reside on the middle floor. We have the ability to move up into the higher floor, which would be like contacting the heavenly realm, having communication and contact with the Spirit of God. Or we can move down into the lower level, which is that earthly realm. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. We're made to function on both an earthly plane and a heavenly plane. The thing is, we've got the earthly thing down pat. We know how to do the earthly thing. But we want to learn how to not walk after the flesh at all times, in all things. We can walk in our flesh, this fleshly body, but we don't want to walk after the flesh. We don't want to walk in the, in the attitude of the flesh. We want to walk in an attitude of the Spirit of God. We want to walk into a spiritual place in Him. We've been made to sit together in high places, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're talking about what happens when we walk in the Spirit. And we need to do that. We need to walk in the Spirit. If we walk in the flesh, always we're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if we learn to walk in the Spirit, we're going to fulfill the will of God. Now, which would you rather do? Satisfy the realm of the flesh? the desire of the flesh, or satisfy God, your creator? Well, I know the answer. I know what your answer would be. Now, uh, man was made, Genesis 1, in the image and in the likeness of God. As God is a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are a triune being, body, soul, and spirit. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, this is a long uh, a long story. We won't go into all the details of that. We have shared different aspects of that with you on the program before. We believe what the New Testament says. Adam was not deceived. 
The Bible clearly says it was Eve that was deceived in the fall. Well, what in the world does that mean? Didn't the Bible say that Adam, that she gave Adam to eat of the fruit and he did partake as well? Yes, the Bible said that. The difference is Eve did it by the spirit of deception. Adam went into it with his eyes wide open. He knew what he was doing. Somebody said, well, isn't that worse? Well, in some ways it is. But when we read the teachings of the Apostle Paul, we understand that what Adam was doing is he was covering the sin of Eve. By, by partaking, by taking on that sin, he was then placing himself as the head of the house in a position to receive the judgment of God. Covering Eve, not that she wouldn't be judged, she was judged. But Adam placed himself in a position where he would hear directly from God on the issue. Now why is that important? Because that's what our Lord Jesus did. He who knew no sin. Now the difference between the first Adam and the second Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah, is that Adam completely partook of the sin. The Lord Jesus knew no sin. But he took on our sin. He carried our sin. He did not participate in our sin. Adam participated in the sin that Eve had committed. Our Lord Jesus took it on his physical body. He bore it to the cross. And, and it was ugly. It was ugly. He, he, he was marred and scarred until he would hardly have been physically recognizable. He wore physically the marks of sin and shame but he did not participate or or uh, partake in sin as adam did now in the fall of adam and eve in the garden that ability to walk with god in the spirit was lost we read about in the scripture that adam and eve walked with god in the cool of the day can you imagine they walked and talked with Almighty God. They had communication. They had communion. They had fellowship with Him. What was the nature of their fellowship, you might ask? The answer is simple. It was spirit to spirit. Spirit to spirit. They were not communicating as you and I communicate flesh to flesh. We communicate flesh to flesh. Uh, and I should say in a normal situation, we're communicating flesh to flesh. Now, why would you say that, preacher? Well, there are times that when we're both walking together in the realm of the Spirit, there is spiritual communication going on. Somebody said, what do you mean? Well, on the simplest level, our spirit can bear witness. The Bible talks about that, that our spirit can bear witness with the spirit of somebody else and know that we both are children of God, a kindred spirit. Have you ever met anybody for the first time, maybe never even had verbal communication with them, but you knew they were a child of God? There was something being communicated on that spirit-to-spirit -spirit level, a low-level uh, I might add, but it was yet a form of spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. This is how Adam fellowship. This is how Eve communed with God, spirit-to-spirit. -spirit. Their communication, though they were walking, Adam and Eve in their fleshly body, it was their spirit. It was that living part of God that he had deposited in them. Maybe we should look at that. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but maybe we should look at that. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Life. Did you know in Hebrew that word life is plural and it could read that the Lord breathed into Adam the breath of lives. Now did he have more than one life? Yes. What are you talking about? Well, by the breath of God, Adam was given soulish life and spirit life. The breath of lives. God scooped up clay and gave him a body, a fleshly, earthly tabernacle or house or body of flesh. 
But when he breathed into him the breath of lives, he released into Adam a life that is soul, soulish, and a life that is spirit, spiritual. Very, very interesting thing. When Adam fell, he lost the ability to communicate with God from the realm of the spirit. I believe that by regeneration, by salvation, by accepting the blood of Jesus Christ and becoming born again, like we read about in John chapter 3, that the potential to restore back our ability to communicate with God spirit to spirit, potentially that has been renewed. And many of us are walking in the lower levels of spirit life. But God is calling us to come up higher. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 tells us that there is a door in heaven that is open. It was open to John and the voice said, come up here, John. Come up here a little higher. I want to show you things that must be hereafter. Now, yes, that was a personal invitation for John on the Isle of Patmos. But I believe that by the rhema, by the spirit word, God is saying you are also given an invitation to come up through the open door and communicate with your creator spirit to spirit. What does that mean? Well, it means that you don't receive it through the flesh, through the five senses. You don't receive it through the soulish realm because the soulish realm is like a filter. It filters things out. It, it allows some things in. It filters some things out. So if we can communicate with God spirit to spirit and not just flesh to flesh or in the realm of the soul, then we can have a pure word from God we can have the pure life of God being exercised in us. Somebody said, what would be the benefit of that? Well, I believe that there's coming a great change to the body of Christ. We've heard about the translation, the resurrection, where our physical bodies are going to be changed. Corruption is going to put on incorruption. Remember? And mortality is going to put on immortality. At the sound of the great trumpet of God, the shout will come, and the great trump of God will sound, and we will be changed. Well, I believe that. I believe this physical body. I believe there will be some who are alive and who remain at the time of the coming of this resurrection period. In other words, I believe many are, will die. People are dying every day. They're going to their graves. But I do not believe. I want you to know, friend, that I do not believe that the grave is the end of the story. For the redeemed, no, it's not the end. For the unredeemed, no, it is not the end. There is a life here after this life. There is a judgment for those who have rejected salvation, the salvation that has been provided from their very creator. Can you imagine rejecting a gift from your creator, the one who made you, the one who allowed you to have the breath of life? You said, well, you're kind of a dumb preacher. Uh, I am a product of a sexual union between my mother and my father. Absolutely you are. There's no doubt about that. But I want you to know the life that is inside of you, the breath of life, didn't come from mommy and it didn't come from daddy. It came predestinated for you, to you, by your creator. It was his will that you be alive. And if it had not been his will, you couldn't have got here if you'd have wanted to. Do you understand what I'm saying? And he has provided for us a way that we can come into oneness with him. We can come into union with him. You remember the Lord Jesus? I know I talk and preach with my hands. I know that could be a little bit distracting. But, and I can promise you that I wouldn't do it. But I wouldn't be able to keep that promise. So I won't, I won't make it. But try to hear what I'm saying. Remember when Jesus was uh, accused, when he was questioned about uh, his relationship with the Father? 
He said, when you've seen me, you have seen the Father because I and my Father are one. Can you imagine what a oneness this was, what a union it was? And yet we read about in the Garden of Gethsemane, we read about a time when the will of his Father and his human will. See, even our Lord Jesus had a human will, that realm of the soul, that, that, that uh, realm where we have a will. Never before do we read that the will of the Father and the will of Jesus, the Son, were in conflict. But in the Garden of Eden, they were in conflict. Somebody said, now that is strange. Well, it's the Bible. It's what the Bible said. Jesus prayed, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. That was his will. That was the will that was coming out of his inner being. That was his will, the will of his flesh, we could say. He, he said, if there's any other way to do it, Father, let's do it that way. But because he walked in such union and agreement and oneness with the Father, the prayer didn't end there by saying, let this cup pass from me. He went on to say, nonetheless, nevertheless, not my will. You see there were two wills? Not my will, but your will be done. That's oneness. What if I told you that I believe that God is calling believers to that kind of oneness, that kind of place of communion and communication with the Father again in this hour. A oneness with the heavenly bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the earthly bride, those who are being called into this uh, overcoming company of people. You really believe that, brother? I do. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that one of the ways that we're going to come into that change for our physical body to be changed at the sound of the trumpet and the shout and the descending all of this we read about in Thessalonians, this physical change where, where many are going to get up out of the grave with a changed body, we read about. I believe the change doesn't start body on the flesh and then move into the spirit man. I believe the change, the resurrection, the rapture, the translation, whatever you choose to call it, the kingdom coming, doesn't matter to me your terminology. I believe that that change to this physical body doesn't begin in the physical body. It begins in the spirit. I believe there must be a change in our spirit man. And I believe that if we have been given senses, five plus senses, to communicate with the earthly realm, then in our spirit, our human spirit, we must have also some senses of how we can communicate and be in communion and be in contact with our Father, with the realm of the Spirit. And when we exercise those spiritual senses, when we learn more about them, what they are, how to yield to God in all things, how to bring our flesh into submission, how to cause our soul to find its proper place so that we don't live by the soul. You see, part of the soul, there's a lot of emotion in there. And we don't want to live by emotion. We want to live by faith. We can have affections. We can be uh, connected, affectionately connected to things that may not be good for us. And that's one of the ways our soul uh, gets its information or gets its life, uh, we could almost say, uh, is through the affections. And reasoning, uh, reasonings can affect the soul. But we don't want to be led by reasoning. We don't want to be led by imagination. We don't want to be led by memories. We want to be led by the Spirit of God from the Spirit out. You see, we want to invite the Lord Jesus to come and regenerate, totally, completely renew, revive, resurrect our human spirit back to how it was in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. When Adam was freshly created in the image of God and the spirit that he had was not just a human spirit as we know it today. Uh, and, and really that's a little ambiguous, this human spirit, what is it? 
we, you know, we have lots of questions about it when we search the scripture. But Adam's spirit, I can, I can tell you more about what Adam's spirit was like than I can mine and yours. Because we've got information, clear, clear information that Adam's spirit in the beginning was God's spirit. It was God's breath. He had in him the very life of God. He lost it in the fall. But by the born again experience, there is a regeneration of that spirit that was lost. And by exercising, by communing, by worshiping, by soaking in the presence of God, we are exercising our spirit life, bringing it back to a place where one day it will rule. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, will sit on the throne of our spirit. It will be renewed and rejuvenated and revived and we will live from the spirit life, not from the soulish realm, not from the fleshly realm. Our spirit, my, I tell you, that makes me excited. It makes me want to reach in. We said that it, we read in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord breathed into Adam the breath of lives, the life of the soul, the life of the spirit. He breathed into him. And... Uh, the Bible says that he was not made from clay. He was made from dust. And dust, all these tiny, tiny little particles, when we look up dust, it reminds us of the dependency that Adam had on his creator. It reminds us that man was created to be dependent on God. We were made to be dependent on our creator. But technology, humanism, earthly knowledge, education, so many things have come in uh, to our life, to our mind. That man has come to a place where, hey, I don't need God. There is no God. I don't need God. If there was a God, I wouldn't need him, but I don't even believe there is a God. We've got atheists, we've got agnostics, and you know that used to be extreme. You know, if someone said I'm an atheist or someone said I'm an agnostic, that was extreme. We thought they were just really out there, almost like some people look at Christians. But that has become a common thought. It's common to meet people who say, I don't believe in God. Or to meet people who have such a broad concept of God that, it's, that it can't be defined. I want you to know my understanding of God can be defined. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That is my concept of God, Genesis 1.1. And John chapter 1, verse 1, that says to us that, that God and the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And then John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, my time is gone. I've enjoyed this teaching. Let me pray for you that the Lord will just give you greater understanding. Father, right now, I pray for every person watching this program today release the holy spirit release understanding open up our hearts and bring us O oh father again restore us to that place of spirit to spirit fellowship with you life to life spirit to spirit oneness and union wow that's what i want that's what we're after in the name of the lord jesus christ we pray Amen. Thank you so much for watching The Eagles Cry, and please tune in again next week. Bye-bye for now.